We're going batty over Halloween and other fall favorites as we take a look at Bewitching Gardens coming up next. Smith, welcome to today's show. Now, this episode is all about having fun and connecting to the festive nature of this mysterious time of year. We're going to connect to the crazy, the spooky, and the macabre. You see, this show was inspired by a visit to a cemetery several years ago where a group of volunteers are actually trying to save a lot of old fashioned roses. This was in Natchez, Mississippi. And when I returned home, I began to participate in a beautification program where we planted historic roses in a local cemetery. Now, I also want to have some fun with some of the colors of the season. And we'll take a look at a list of plants who have some really interesting names. They'd be perfect for a spooky patch in your garden. They have names like bat-faced kufia and spider flower. This would be a great little project to do with a kid where you could research the names and then plot them out in the garden. And we'll get to that a little later in the show. We'll also travel to Savannah, Georgia, a city known for its many ghost stories and, coincidentally, garden stories. We'll catch up with a chef who shares a garden fresh recipe with us a little later. But first, we're off to New Hampshire, where we'll meet a nurseryman who goes all out to showcase his plants in new and interesting ways. You'll be inspired right after this. The fall in New England is nothing short of brilliant. Oranges, reds, bronzes, these festive colors greet us at every turn. But this is autumn. During the hot summer months, the cooler days of October and November are far from the minds of nurserymen who are busy getting ready for the fall market. Each year, Jeff Huntington and his team create display gardens designed to inspire at Pleasant View Gardens in Loudoun, New Hampshire. At Pleasant View Gardens, besides our young plants, we also grow finished plant material that we ship throughout New England to different garden centers. And what we try to create here is an opportunity for our retailers to come and visit and see what's new and, and how we're displaying, how we make our gardens. And we've also opened it to the public. The last couple of years, what I've tried to do is make some facades, like what's behind me. And what we're trying to create here is a whimsical type of garden setting that the retailer could take back to their own garden center and create the same display or so the homeowner could view that and see wow that's an interesting fun way to, to decorate with plants. A lot of the plants that we have in this display are plants that we sell different times of the year but again a lot of them are cold tolerant and they there's a lot of good fall colors, bright reds, oranges, yellows. We have some grasses like the K-Rexes that are commonly called dead grass and, and they have that brown foliage. And so, you know, it goes nicely with fall colors. Fall magic is a great plant, especially here up here in New England where we have great fall color. And so you're able to blend a lot of these colors in with your landscape as, as your leaves are changing and your shrubs and in the trees and the leaves fall. It mixes great. Also, you can add corn stalks and, and pumpkins and, and other live fall type of material, and it, it just makes for a very nice display. We've also tried to create some, some other facades. We have a, a pretty traditional front door that we've created, and with the containers growing more and more popular, we've, we've tried to show how simple it can be and how easy it is with, and, and also by mixing shrubs and annuals or perennials in, in a container. And it's not as hard as people think it is. So that's what we've created here. We've created some other facades also, but it's just a way for people to, a lot of people are scared to decorate with plants. And, and they love plants, but they're scared to decorate with them. And so we're just trying to show them different ways and how to use plants to, and have fun with plants. Pleasant View's Display Garden is a great example of showcasing the many ways plants can be used to have a little fun in the garden. Now up next, we'll take a look at plants that fit the colors of the season, orange and black, and get ideas on a special garden with names like Toad Lily and Dracula Orchid. So stay tuned.
Nothing extends color into our fall gardens better than chrysanthemums. And the range of colors that we can find in them today is really quite amazing. Virtually every color except for blue can be found. There's burgundy and red, salmon and orange and pink, as well as white and yellow. Now there's also great diversity among the flower shapes and forms of mums. This is the classic daisy form. Now from this, the spoon tip daisy was developed. Now if you're looking for something light and airy, you might want to try one of the spider mums. Then of course there's the classic pom-pom and this relatively new flower form called the anemone. As you can see there's really no end to the choices. Now when you select mums at the nursery there are a few things I want you to remember. First, you want to make sure that the plant is heavily budded. Don't buy too many in bloom because you want the plant to bloom as long as possible for you. The other thing to remember is the soil really should be completely moist. Never buy mums that are dehydrated. You see, if the plant ever completely wilts, these stems will shrivel and the buds will rarely open into flowers. With so many flowers packed into one plant, how can you resist the beauty? So if the brilliant colors of mums are a little too much for you, then maybe you'd enjoy a more subdued palette, perhaps even the ever popular color black. You know, it's always in fashion but perhaps no more than this time of year. Just ask the phantom in the cape. Black plants that I've enjoyed include black magic elephant ear, blacky sweet potato vine, and black night canna. And for those of us who might want to try our hand at some plants with rather unusual names, how about witch hazel? It's a beautiful shrub that blooms in the winter, and it's known for its antibacterial qualities. But the name, well, it's hard to beat this time of year. And then there's Crocosmia, like this one, which is red hot called Lucifer. There's a fantastic ornamental pepper called Medusa. Doesn't it look like the snakes on the head of a mythological figure? And when we were kids, we used to love to mash up this plant, Bloodroot. Now I want you to take a look at this plant. It doesn't have a spooky or macabre name, but I think it's really interesting. I think there's a bit of mystery in how, not so much how, but why, the leaves fold down at night and then open up during the day. This is an oxalis, sometimes called a shamrock, but this variety has a gorgeous red leaf and a pink flower. It's called charmed wine, and it's a wonderful perennial for the garden. Now we're off to mysterious savannah in a bit, but first, a trip to the graveyard. We'll dig up the dirt on some really tough plants, so stay with us. If you're a lover of roses, particularly the old-fashioned varieties. An old cemetery like this is a likely place to find them, as well as many other old-fashioned plants. This is the Natchez City Cemetery, positioned high on a bluff overlooking the mighty Mississippi River. Graves here date back as far as the late 1700s. The roses in the cemetery, uh, some of them are probably older than 80 years, maybe even 100 years old, and they've survived without any care for all that time. Terry Tillman is an antique rose enthusiast and has taken an interest in preserving these roses and introducing varieties that would have been found here before the Civil War and after. Well, after the Heritage Rose Foundation met here in 1993, they began a mapping survey. I finished the mapping survey, and then a group of women in the Garden Club formed a cemetery rose preservation committee, and we've divided the cemetery up into manageable sizes in two to three women take over an entire plat, so to speak, and they're responsible for pruning and mulching those roses on a twice a year, perhaps. This is real dirt gardening work when you take on a cemetery project, but it's, once you divide it up, it's very easy to manage, and it's something that anybody can do in his or her community. And what a tribute to that community. You know, Alan, you can probably find more antique roses in the Natchez City Cemetery today than you can anywhere else in town, but this wasn't always the case. Um, a traveler came through here in 1857 and wrote an article for a well-known journal, The Horticulturist, and he said that Natchez was the Persia of roses. In no other state of the Union, he wrote, have they ever attained such beauty and perfection. What a wonderful quote. Well, I'd like to see Natchez be worthy of that term again. I'd like to have visitors come and call it the Persia of roses, so we're going to keep working at the cemetery and try to maintain these beautiful roses. With antique roses in every garden. Absolutely.
You know, that's a very inspiring story. In fact, it inspired me to participate in the beautification of a cemetery that's very close to my house in this historic district. You see, in the center of Mount Holly Cemetery is a beautiful sexton's cottage that was built in the late 19th century. Some of the graves go way back to the early 19th century. And so what we did is we decided to plant a lot of roses that really reflected the period of the people who settled this area and are buried in that cemetery. We planted varieties such as Russell's Cottage Rose from the 1840s, as well as Caldwell Pink, and some species roses such as the Cherokee Rose. Now what's interesting is that these are planted throughout the cemetery and they get very little care. No watering, very little pruning, and fertilizing every once in a while. Now we think of roses as being delicate and difficult plants to grow, but all you have to do is walk through a cemetery and you can see that actually many of them are disease resistant and very tough. Okay, now it's time for one of my favorite parts of the show. It's when I answer questions from viewers such as yourself. Now, this is all about fail-proof gardening. And I got a letter from a lady called Edna in the Great Northwest and she says, Dear Alan, I need a plant that looks great even if I forget about it. I'm a hopeless brown thumb. Well, Edna, I admire your sense of humor, but actually there's some plants that I think can help you. These are called the stone crops or sedums. And since the show is on the macabre, it might be interesting to point out that there's a variety called dragon's blood. It's really tough. In fact, there are over 350 different types of sedums, and many of them can take harsh conditions, whether it's very cold temperatures or full bright sun. In addition to being tough little garden plants, they also make great candidates for container growing. Another name for sedum is stone crop, and just as the name implies, they'll grow in poor stony soils. So when you prepare your soil mix, don't make it too rich, and you want to make sure that it's very well drained. I prepare a simple blend of one part pea gravel to one part sand to two parts potting soil, and I've found it most effective to take several varieties of sedum and nestle them all together into a single container. Now, Edna, if you try the sedums and you have some success and you want to step out there and try a few other things, I'll admire your courage. In fact, I'll help you. Just go to my website, pallensmith.com, and you can find a list of some more easy-to-grow plants that'll bring you a lot of happiness. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. You know, the main thing is just to get out there and have some fun, and this is a great time of year to do it. Until next time, from the garden, I'm Alan Smith. In this garden I dream of a bed of flowers, bluebirds sing of the beauty all around. Every time the sun comes out, I can't help but smile. Oh, no, I can't help but smile.